Hello, I would like to introduce myself as a humble representative of the supreme intelligence of the universe. Actually, even far more than that, the very source of all creation and of all life that is an ultimate perfection and manifestation of love that is the very source of love. And yes, I could get into a very integral scientific definition of this love and of truth. But at this point, I will forbear. We hear a lot of talk these days about AI and how this AI is becoming so much more intelligent than man. Why? Some people even say they're going to be like human beings, the very source of their own action. They're going to have souls or whatever. I mean, we hear all this talk, but the scientific facts are a little different than the fantasy of, and the conceit that people have about AI intelligence. And I want to address this, first of all, by showing you a good number of very amazing videos that will, for the vast majority of the public, be an eye-opener, a big eye-opener. You can make your own judgments after you see these videos. So I want to begin by showing you some of these statements that people make about AI intelligence, particularly from one of these people that is the advisor to Klaus Schwab. Um, we'll, we will look at some of the things he has said, first of all. Um, so, this is Yuval Noah Harari, and so I'm going to minimize myself, but first we'll play, just start it like this, and I'll just... We don't have to wait until Christ's second coming uh, in order to overcome death. A laboratory can do it, if you give them enough time and money. You have a lovely passage where you say, looking at the world today, God seems to be making a comeback, but this is a mirage. God is dead. It just takes a while to get rid of the body. <laughs> and these people I, laugh. I don't think life has any meaning. Really? Um, so so in, in that sense, it's, 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 not, it's, it's, not, it's not a strong counter-argument. I know that many religions and philosophies have based the meaning of life on death and what, ha what happens after death. But I think these are all fictional stories that people have invented he uh, for history. They are not the truth. We'll because He's... throughout history, uh, death was kind of the great equalizer. I mean, the poor people always told themselves, say, in the Middle Ages, yes, now these rich people, they have all the good things in life, but they will die in the end, at least that. Uh, just think what it means to be a poor person in a world when you die, but the rich continue to live young and beautiful forever. I mean, that's a cause for a lot of anger. Mm. If you think about uh, the Bible, for example, so in the first book of Genesis, what God does is to create animals and plants and humans, and we now want to gain this ability to ourselves to manufacture uh, animals and, and, and plants and humans. And we even go beyond God I mean, even if you believe in the Bible, the only thing the God of the Bible managed to create is organic beings. Okay. I uh, managed to create the cows and the tomatoes. Okay, so we, we've seen enough of this one, okay? Just giving you a little taste of this fellow that is the advisor to Klaus Schwab, who is the leader of the World Economic Forum that all these people like Trudeau and and Macron and many others, Biden, sit there and listen to him like he's some great wise person. Oh, okay, let's just take a look a bit more. So we'll minimize this video and we'll go to the next one. Hear him say a few more things here. 
thing about AI that everybody needs to know. It's the first technology ever that can create new ideas. You know, the printing press, radio, television, they broadcast, they spread the ideas created by the human brain, by the human mind. They cannot create a new idea. You know, Gutenberg printed the Bible in the middle of the 15th century. The, the, the printing press printed as many copies of the Bible as Gutenberg instructed it, but it did not create a single new page. It had no ideas of its own about the Bible. Is it good? Is it bad? How to interpret this? How to interpret that? Um, AI can create new ideas, can even write a new Bible. We, you know, throughout history, religions dreamt about having a book written by a superhuman intelligence, by a non-human entity. Every religion claims our book, all the other books of the other religions, they humans wrote them. But our book, no, 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 no. It came from some superhuman intelligence. In a few years, there might be religions that are actually correct. That just think about a religion whose holy book is written by an AI. That could be a reality. Oh, oh, oh. You know what? Before I go on with this, with showing you some other videos here that are going to be far more amazing than this introductory part here, I've got to, I've got to make a few comments here. I mean, AI, he is talking like man is, like they've reached some great intelligence with this AI. You know what? Uh, they find when they put input into AI, because people are such liars like he is, to believe all of these things without really any real science that is genuine science behind it, which I can show you the evidence for later on. <laughs> there he goes talking about this AI like it can do all of these amazing things and and yet because people are putting into the AI things that aren't true they're discovering the AI is giving outputs and lying to them and deceiving them and they know it is and they found all this stuff that it creates that are total lies because you see man is corrupt and so whatever he's putting into this is going to be corrupt you know what particle physics has discovered that there are many dimensions besides the physical dimension and there's mathematical language that highly confirms far superior dimensions from the analysis of the particle physics. Mathematical language that is very used in many other fields of science effectively. It shows that the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh all the way up to the tenth dimension are far superior to the physical dimension. It's like this physical dimension is 2D as opposed to 3D, that's how much more real the ultra-real permanent realm is just in the fourth and fifth dimensions. And of course, there's all kinds of people repeatedly that die on the operating people, highly confirmed as dead, and they're telling doctors every detail of what they were talking about, what they were doing on their body, what their family was saying in the room next door or down the road or whatever. And this repeats itself over and over, which is one of the highest forms of empirical evidence. And one of the big things that people like Nohel, this, this fellow, Noel Yovo Harari, if I'm pronouncing his name right, that believe in evolution, is they say, well, the creationists cannot show us any evidence that is presently can be demonstrated and verified. Well, they sure certainly can't on evolution. And every field evolu of evolution now has been pretty well decimated with incredibly irrefutable evidence. Well, things have changed. And now we can demonstrate, unlike the evolutionists, 
solid, irrefutable evidence in the present. And I'm going to point out some of this. And so here you have these people talking about things that they're creating in this very inferior third physical dimension, like they're God, and they're going to replace God. Well, I want to go and show you some more videos that will amaze you of some of these discoveries that are verifiable and can be demonstrated as well so that now creationism is not only passive in evidence but on the offense, whereas the evolutionists can't go on the offense. In fact, they talk like their teaching is some religious creed that you must believe in whether there's the evidence or not. Over and over again, they do this. We don't want to hear that in our school or you're going to be demoted because you don't believe what we believe. Some dogma, and they won't face the evidence, but I'm going to show you the evidence. It's no wonder that it says in one verse in the Bible that he that sits in the heavens shall laugh at them, that he shall have them in derision. Man in his conceit, this little creature, acting like he's God, and in his conceit thinking that all of this stuff he's making is some big thing, like he's creating things that are greater than God created. Let's just see some of the evidence now. I'm going to point it out to you. Okay? This is evidence that you cannot refute. I'm going to start gradually going into all of this. So here we go with this, right here with the next video. So here's the next video on wonders. As we look at that DNA, we see that it has a double helix structure. That means it has two linked together, and they look much like a spiral staircase. This structure is perfect as it looks like that spiral staircase for packing lots of information in a very small space. Every cell in your body contains a strand of DNA, and each strand is about six feet long. How does a six-foot-long strand of DNA fit inside each one of your tiny cells? Well, God designed DNA to be able to coil and fold into a tiny space. Imagine an electrical cord that is 100 feet long. Then think about looping that electrical cord so that it curls up in a roll about the size of a trash can lid. Then imagine that you have several of those looped cords stacked on top of each other. Well, that gives you an idea of how DNA coils. DNA is a molecule and the backbone of the molecule is made of a sugar phosphate. The little things that look like stairs are called base pairs. The base pairs store information in a coded language. They're combinations of four compounds, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Adenine always connects to thymine, and cytosine always connects to guanine. A strand of human DNA contains about 3 billion base pairs. Just one strand. You may know that the study of DNA is called genetics. It's named after a DNA feature known as a gene. A gene is a group of base pairs that contain instructions to make one basic trait. It can be compared to a word. The base pairs can be compared to letters that make up the word. A gene can be made up of 1,000 base pairs all the way up to 2 million base pairs. Just like some words are small, such as it, and other words are long, like pachycephalosaurus, DNA can actually code information like words. And that information is a language. Did you know that researchers have learned how to store information like words and sentences in strands of DNA? They're using DNA like a thumb drive that can collect words and pictures. Some scientists believe that all pictures and words and every bit of data in the whole world can be stored in an amount of DNA that would fit in one tablespoon. Brilliant researchers, they've spent years trying to figure out how to make data storage devices smaller and smaller. Doesn't it just make sense 
that God's data storage device is the best one that anybody's ever seen? You see, DNA can also replicate itself, making an exact copy, and that's how every single one of the cells in your body has the same DNA. The human body contains more than 30 trillion cells. 30 trillion. If you could take the DNA out of each one of your cells and stretch it out and connect them in a chain, it would stretch more than 10, 10 billion miles. That means it could go to the sun and back about 60 times. DNA is complex. It's Very brilliantly complex. designed. It's the best storage device in the world, and there is no way it could have evolved over millions of years of random chance accidental processes. Imagine trying to get instructions for a working, walking, talking robot by taking billions of letters and throwing them all in a pile and randomly pulling them out. Well, that's just not possible. We know that. So that gives you an idea on this video of that. Now let's go on and let's take a little bit of a look at DNA in action here with another video. It's going to start coiling. There it is, processing it. Gene transcription. That's inside the cell. That's the exterior you're looking at. Those strands are DNA coiled. Here, I'll show you some few, a few other pictures here on here. Oh, look, watch this part. This is where it's getting coiled, I think. Each of your 10 trillion cells has 1.8 meters of DNA. show you many many other operations here like this one here which is doing something with the DNA. The copying mechanism presented at real time speed. So doing another copy of the DNA. These are complex, very complex. That's what's happening in one of your little cells that are so small you can't even see it. A microscope. Unless you got a powerful microscope. You can see all these complex operations taking place in the cell. So that gives you an idea of the complexity within your cell with these amazing machines. This is just in the physical dimension. The intelligence of God is so good. You only have to see what he created in our cells. And we think we're doing something with AI, really? Compared to God, you're doing nothing. Let's go on. I want to show you another amazing fact about DNA. I'm going to be showing you some amazing facts about DNA in the next few videos down that 
put creationism on the offensive with demonstrated things that are highly verifiable and demonstrated in time. So that it totally, this alone devastates the theory of evolution. But this, as we go on, we'll do it even more. Watch this video. And in 2011, groundbreaking, groundbreaking research suggested something even more impressive, that human residents could be connected to the beginnings of life itself. The breakthrough came at the hands of Luc Montagnier, the Nobel Prize winning scientist who first discovered the HIV virus. The professor was conducting water memory experiments, examining how water could retain a memory of substances that had previously been dissolved in it, when he stumbled upon something that would challenge the very principles of science. All life comes from life. This is a fundamental principle of science and one which has never been violated in any experiment. Life can only exist where life has existed before. And the mechanism for this has always been understood to be a material one, such as egg and sperm or spore and cell division. Just want to make sure everything's okay. Yeah, it is. But Luc Montagnier's experiments have offered a very different hypothesis. The professor showed that DNA sequences the very building blocks of life communicate with each other in water by emitting low frequency electromagnetic waves. Even when the DNA was kept in separate test tubes, the professor still recorded electromagnetic communication between them. How sophisticated could this communication be? Well, Luc Montagnier showed they are able to organize nucleotides, the ingredients which actually make up DNA, into brand new DNA. Science has combined these ingredients countless times before, but in no experiment have they ever been able to recreate the spark of life and transform nucleotides into actual DNA, not without DNA already being present. Life after all can only exist where life has existed before. But in Luc Montagnier's experiments, the DNA had been completely filtered from the water, yet new DNA was still formed. Now that's just amazing. how was this possible? I'm just going to leave it there. How had Luc Montagnier managed to achieve what no other scientist? And that's all we need to know on that particular video. And so I will go on to explain to you, as we will continue to watch this, I go on to explain to you here that in that video, what it showed was that he had DNA in one test tube and in the other test tube, no DNA, just water. And yet that DNA sent frequencies through the glass into the air and into the glass and into the water of the other test tube with no DNA and created DNA. That totally blows the theory of evolution right out of the water there and is demonstrated right in front of your eyes. So don't tell me evolutionists that we don't have things that totally demonstrate that your theory is a lie, because it is. And every field of science shows that it's a mastery of deception. So we're going to go on and see even greater evidence than what I'm just showing you here. So I will go on with the videos here that we are playing the next one and I will minimize myself again but we'll start the next video first here we'll start playing it I published in 2000 and the predictions of the young earth Y chromosome molecular clock this captured the globe first of all before I play this video I want to point out to you that they have discovered a way with the Y chromosomes to measure time back. And they, it comes out that man is only around 6,000 years old, just like the Bible shows from its history that man is. 
In fact, they've already traced back with the Y chromosomes and DNA right to Noah, to his sons, and they can tell whether you're from one of the sons of Noah, Japheth, which is usually the, known as the white race, and Shem, which is the Jews and others. Uh, amazingly, they found out in DNA that the English people are from Shem, and the Indians are from Shem, Shem and the Chinese are from Shem, the vast majority of them. But they are, you're going to see in this that the evidence they have, and that they can demonstrate over and over again, they're recovering all kinds of things and verifying it in historical things with the DNA. And okay, we'll see the arguments of what the scientists that want to believe in the theory of evolution have, and you'll find out they have no argument. All they have is their religion that is circular reasoning. And this is on the offensive against it, whereas they don't have any offensive on their side. Show me your demonstration of evolution. We're showing you it's a lie. Right here with this. No ho. Harari, or however you pronounce your name, and your pride and insolence against the Creator, and all you others that don't want to believe that your life was created by God, and that you will be held accountable to Him, whether you like it or not. And He is love, and He will do everything in His power to try to draw you into knowing Him as your source of love and of life. How, I, I'll go on and share more about that. I want you to watch this video. Global history of human population growth. These are, and again, the initial steps to see if we can find the history of civilization. And I should say, this finding, this match right here, that is one major element of the history of civilization. How humanity, the human, human population sizes have risen and fallen. It's, it's basically a hockey stick shaped curve. And we can, we can see that hockey stick shape in the DNA extremely strongly with a 4,500-year time scale. It matches well. Let me stop for a minute, and let's, let's step back and think about what should happen next if creation science is science. Well, these findings should never be the end of the story. They should make new predictions. So this global data predicts we should see regional matches between the DNA and the known history of human population rises and falls in a specific region. That was another paper, 2020, looking at the pre-Columbian and post-Columbian history of the Americas. If you've read the book Traced, you know that in, uh, I think in one of the appendices, I talk about data I didn't have in 2019 or 2020. When these papers came out, North African data. So here's another region where I could test the predictions. We know the history, for example, in this case of Nigeria, and there was data published for the Mozabites, an, an Algerian population. And there's again, this is from the, one of the color plates in the book Traced. There's again a tremendous match here. There's also data in the book talking about the Middle East. Great, more fulfilled predictions. And if you're following this train of thought, you should know that again, that, that the next question should be, what else does this predict? You never stop there, you just keep going. Well, to summarize then, the father son mutation rate predicted global population growth curve matches to the Y chromosome data, which predicted regional matches. So the father-son mutation rate for the Young Earth time scale, it predicted this, that was fulfilled, it predicted this, which predicted that we should see the history of civilization in the Y chromosome tree, and that is essentially the central thesis of the book trace that we can see it all over the family tree. That's 2022, we saw the prediction there, and uh, I've, I've mentioned this in the previous videos, I think, in the process of finding the history of civilization, we also found, to my surprise and delight, the echo, the genetic echo, of the Genesis 10 male family tree. If you know your Bible, you know the Genesis 10 records the male descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the three sons of Noah, and there's differences in the lengths of those family trees before Babel happens and people disperse. All that to say, long story short, you can see that you can count off the generations. You can see here's Shem and his son Arphaxad, and here's a descendant Eber, and, and so on. And this is not the end. We're still making predictions. One of the strongest predictions that's guiding research going forward, where the rubber really 
meets the road is being able to predict where in the globe we'll find new branches, where on the tree those branches will fall, and how many men you have to sample to find them. Those are three precise technical elements of this model that make predictions to this day. And I'm still testing them. So again, this is the book that I referred to. Some of this backstory, again, you can find on this uh, on the Answers from Genesis YouTube channel, the Traced DNA's Big Surprise playlist. I went through this quickly because it's review, but I want you to see again, creation science is pushed back against four decades of criticism by making and fulfilling, and making and fulfilling, and still making testable predictions. So if you, the research is ongoing. We haven't stopped. If you want to participate in future research, go to ancestorsgenesis.org slash go slash traced. That's the title of the book. You'll find a button right here that you can click on, or you can just scroll down. You'll find a place to enter your name, email. I think now we've got a phone number element up there, box you can enter. Critics of creation science for decades have demanded that creation scientists produce testable predictions by which we can, they could in theory falsify creation science. And creation science has met that standard and far exceeded it. And those, the reason we've done five videos giving the backstory is to show you there's a decade long pattern of this. That's spectacular. But the point of this talk is to analyze how the critics have responded. And that brings us to the, to the final element of this thesis, the quiet revolution, how young earth science is pushing back four decades of criticism. Why is this a quiet revolution? Well, think about another element of this standard for science that we've been reflecting on, testable predictions. By their nature, testable predictions are dangerous. Why? Because anyone who makes them puts their credibility on the line. In other words, you make a testable prediction, I make a testable prediction, I'm giving evolutionists the rope by which to hang my ideas. I'm saying, I predict this, and what I predict might be wrong. Now, you'd think the evolutionary community would be beside themselves with joy that there are these testable predictions now in print that they could knock themselves out doing experiment after experiment after experiment, refuting experimentally what creation scientists have said. So what do you think they've done? If you don't believe what I'm about to say, you can look it up yourself. Daniel Cardinal, Herman Mays, and Joel Duff are the main professionals, scientific professionals, who've responded. And we're going to get into some of the details of what they've done here in a moment. Well, I'm going to focus here on Daniel Cardinal. He's a virologist at Rutgers. Herman Mays is an evolutionary biologist at Marshall. If you've been following my work, you know I did a debate with him on my book, Replacing Darwin, several years ago. Joel Duff is a professing Christian and a professor of biologist at Akron in Ohio. I want to focus on what Cardinal says because his critique has some of the most points, most detail, covers a lot of the ground that the other guys do. So his critique is a, is a, is a great one stop for understanding how the mainstream community has responded to this work. And I want to focus on one point that Cardinal made several times. So you can see here, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm giving you a screenshot from his video, YouTube video, Book Review Trace by me, of course, and there's, there's Daniel himself presenting this. You'll notice up here the big problem. So that's his own words. He's saying, here's the big problem with my work. And I'll show you, he repeats this same point under other subheadings. He's got about six. I'm banging my microphone again because I'm excited. He says, the big problem, my simple error, is conflating genealogy with phylogeny. If you don't know those terms are foreign to you, he's essentially saying, I've taken the father-son mutation rate, genealogy, and extrapolated it into the past, assuming it's been constant. That's the phylogeny part. And he cites a textbook. Now you might say, whoa, 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 whoa. Didn't you already address that point? Well, yes, yes, I did three years ago. And number one, he doesn't seem to be aware this even exists. Number two, and here's the bigger point. This is the bombshell. 
What is his justification? That's a textbook reference. He's saying it's wrong. What I'm doing is wrong because it disagrees with the textbook. Apparently, evolutionists have a holy book that you can't question. Apparently, mainstream science has sacred ideas, perhaps not engraved in stone, but in ink on paper that define the rightness or wrongness of a scientific idea. You would think the textbook itself, if it was scientific, would be open to testing, falsifiability, and everything else that defines science. But not according to Dr. Dan, which again, he, these are the leading people responding to what I'm saying. And the big problem, his words, is that I'm conflating genealogy and phylogeny, and the textbook says otherwise. Amazing. Evolutionists, by their own behavior, have a religion. And you can't question that religion. You can't do science in disagreement to that religion. And just to show you, he's, he's camping out on this point, point number four of his critique, overlaying phylogeny and pedigree. Same thing again. Pedigree is the father-son. Same like extrapolate in times past. <laughs> he says, you can't do that. It's just astonishing, mind-boggling. You can't apparently question the textbook or do experiments to evaluate experimentally what the textbook says. So let me ask you a question, you the viewer. Which of the two camps, young earth creationists or evolutionists, are the ones who refuse to take data and weigh it against opposing scientific data and thereafter reach the conclusions? Which of these two camps is the one that claims to be doing science but starts with a conclusion and refuses, it, refuses to change it, regardless of the evidence developed in the course of the investigation. Which of these two views, creation science or evolution, are assaulting the entire mode of scientific thought and the guiding principle of science that traditional beliefs are open to skeptical inquiry? Which of these two views rests on authority, perhaps not of the Bible, but of the textbook and its most literal interpreters of the textbook. Which of these two has created a fundamental conflict? Which of these two views uses evidence and logical deduction is forever uncertain? Which of these two views says there are irrefutable facts put in print that cannot be refuted by tomorrow's experiments? Which of these two views encourages skepticism, questioning, independent thought, and the use of reason. Which of these two views seeks, to, seeks chinks in the armor of established ideas, and which of these two views absolutely defends the armor from any attack and says it's established, it cannot be questioned? Which of these views is tentative? Which of these questions belief in authority? Which of these views is anti-science? That's the bombshell. That's the event that has turned the tables. Creation, science have, creation scientists have met decades-old challenges to creationism, exceeded those challenges, put testable predictions in print, have fulfilled those predictions, have made more predictions, are continuing to test those predictions. And evolutionists have responded, to my great surprise, in a religious manner. And I'm not saying they're religious. I'm saying they have defined religion by being, they have defined religion by saying it's not open to skeptical inquiry and all these other things I just read to you. They're behaving in the exact manner that they've accused creation scientists of behaving for years. So we've come full circle. Wow. The creationists are engaging in skeptical inquiry. Everything I've just mentioned to you that's what the creationists are doing, and the evolutionists now are sitting in the seat where creationists supposedly once sat. Completely traded spots. This is, this is revolutionary. And again, it's a gift. It's an unforced error. I've published my book. The evolutionists could have taken those predictions and tested them. And instead, they've responded in a religious way. 
And this is not some obscure corner of the internet. These are the leading people responding to this leading work of creation science. This defines the creation evolution debate. Massive. So there's more arguments that they've put in print. That was that was again, that was the big problem Cardinal mentioned. And there's other points we'll eventually get to. I'll tell you where you can find the refutations here in a minute. But this is the book we've been discussing. It came out in March of 2022. It fulfills predictions made in this book, replacing Darwin. This deals with a wider question of the origin of species. This again is written for someone who's skeptical of evolution. If you're not, if you hold a creation science, excuse me, this is written for someone who's skeptical of creation science and thinks evolution is true. I, I, I wrote it for skeptics of the Bible, essentially. But if you believe the Bible, you know, there's a lot you can learn from this. I, but I have made a Cliff Notes version where I do have primarily a Christian audience in mind. I've referenced this video series multiple times. This concludes this video series, at least the section that we're looking at the backstory to trace. We'll probably have some videos in the future as we talk about research that's ongoing. There's been some really exciting stuff that's happened within the last year since the book came out. And, and stay tuned for that. Okay, I will leave it at that there for this particular part. Ooh, we got some kind of crazy thing that came up there. I don't know what that's about. There we go. So, we could continue now. Just to show you one other thing here, this is how they've discovered the history of the Indians in the United States. It's a long video, so I'm only going to point out to you the video. It's over an hour long, but I just wanted to play a few little, short little pieces here of it so that you can take Draw your attention to another section of the tree in the Americas that will be especially important here in a few minutes once we bridge the gap. It's this other branch known as C. This is also found in Central Asia, among other places. You can find it in the Pacific as well. In past videos and in writing, I've talked about this branch arriving in the Americas a little bit later, around 1000 AD. That was a rough estimate based on the data that was available at that time. I can tell you now that we have more data that we can probably revise that and make it more precise to about the 900s AD. That's, when That's the still Indians several came. centuries after haplogroup Q. And if we back up a second, I can cover something I forgot to mention just a few minutes ago. The size of these circles represents the relative abundance. So you can see these circles right here are not quite as large as the circles for this branch. Haplogroup is just the term for branch, Q. So about 90% of Navajos, this, this circle right here, belong to haplogroup Q, whereas just a fraction of them, you can see it's a tiny circle right here, belong to this haplogroup or branch C. And again, this is we can, we can revise this now to the 900s. This is all information I've put in print in this book, Traced, came out in March of 2022. Traced in Medina is a big surprise, and I've talked about it in previous video series, which I'll, I'll point you to those links in a moment. So just to summarize then, I covered a lot of ground fairly quickly, again, because this has been covered elsewhere, and this sets up how we're going to begin to bridge this gap. What this Y chromosome research implies is multiple settlings of the Americas. You'll notice I didn't talk about BC era branches. Who gave rise to the Mayans, to the Olmecs? That's because we don't have those branches yet. That's something we're still looking for. Okay, I'm just giving you a little touch on that one. That's a long video. It goes into detail of what they've discovered about the history of the Indians coming from, well, a lot of them came from east of the Caspian Sea and other areas there in Siberia. Um, so that's another big topic, and they've found very great details of their movements in North America, and that's, you'd have to watch the video on that one. Okay, so now we come to, um, I think I will leave it at that for this particular video series, but I want to now, in the end here, uh, continue and um, just explain in the end that there is evidence not just in this field, although this field of genealogy and being able to get verification and, and have all of these things discovered in the past, is he mentions like a new Rosetta Stone that is major and with major uh, all kinds of things being discovered in history now that were 
on Nellum and that have been verified also. Um, I won't go into all of that. You can check that out. There's, he has lots of videos in that area. But you can see that there's overwhelming evidence in many fields of science. And I'm just touching a few. Uh, you know, even the long dating that they have for the Earth and all this is based on all kinds of presumptions, and it's been shown to have error. I mean, there's radiocarbon dating. When you put it in the dinosaurs and all this stuff, it goes, it's still there. It shouldn't be there if they're millions of years old, and it shows that they're very young. There's the fact that many dinosaurs have uh, been discovered with blood cells in them and flexible um, tissue that can only survive in the thousands of years. And um, the earth is being shown by genealogy, the beginning of man, and so on to only go back 6,000 years. There's 105 young earth indicators. I mentioned the one with the dinosaurs and the blood and the flesh. There's many other fields of science. They found complex uh, in, in the layers that are supposed to be so old. They found in the oldest layer, like the Cambrian, a shoe print with a trilobite in it, um, you know, they found footprints with does dinosaur footprints. They found very complex um, species that look exactly the same today in the oldest layers, in, very, in every layer. And they don't tell you that there's other things in those layers they found that shouldn't be there and that haven't changed over the millions of years. And they don't have any transitions. It's very evident that God has arranged genetics so that there's great variety within kinds, but there's no such a thing as transitions from one kind to another, such as, uh, you know, a bird to a dinosaur or a land animal to a whale. And they can't show these transitions. And so it doesn't matter what field of science there is, it's all been blown apart, especially with this amazing evidence. And so I want to share with you in the end here I want to give you a very integral scientific de definition of truth by which you can filter all things. And so I want to define truth this way. Dictionaries say that truth is basically that which is real or reality. And so you look up the word real and reality in various dictionaries, and it basically means that which is indestructible, unchangeable, absolute, that's what reality is. Now, what is reality? What, there's only one thing that reality could be, so let me sh share with you why it could only be one possible thing. And I will begin to describe reality this way by the only word that would most, that would be proper in order to describe reality. And that is, an ultimate perfection of love. And I'm going to describe what this love could only possibly be. It could only possibly be a quality of being that always freely chooses the highest lasting good over any lesser choice. Because any lesser choice as such would have a measure of corruption in it. This love has such purity and, and integrity that, as it were, it is a blazing fire of judgment against all that is contrary to this love that always chooses the highest lasting good. It is the very opposite of corruption. In fact, it is the destroyer of corruption. It will not condone the slightest that is contrary to this ultimate pure perfection of love which in the Greek language would be described as agape love, the highest form of love. And then there's philia, which is the feeling love, and eros, which is the sexual. This love is represented in nature by the negative symbol, electricity, math, everything has negatives and positives. That negative symbol represents cutting off all corruption, and it also represents an indestructible foundation. And we know that there is the second law of thermodynamics in science, which says that everything left on its own will always go towards greater and greater disorder or corruption, if you will, to complete destruction. Which means 
since there's an infinite past, that this should have already happened in the infinite past. Or if you want to say a hundred billion years ago or a billion billion years ago or whatever. But here we are in a highly complex creation with cells like I have just shared that points to an ultimate source of intelligence. And what is more intelligence than a love that always chooses the highest lasting good? So the negative symbol represents the first aspect of this, this love, which is the integrity that love must have in order to genuinely be love. And the other aspect is formed out of the negative symbol, which is the positive symbol or the symbol of the cross. And here's an interesting side note that the last letter of the alphabet in ancient languages going back to 1500 BC, 2000 BC and earlier is the symbol of the cross just as we know it today. And what that last letter meant was a sign and a symbol. And so when we have crosses as symbols and graveyards, it doesn't represent just Christianity from the time of Christ on. It represents who God is from the very beginning of time. So what does this pos positive symbol represent? It represents that this love is so great out of its integrity that the creator God could have a love so great that he could become a perfect atoning substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. Some people think God is so small that he couldn't communicate with his creation or that he couldn't come in human form and, and communicate with man. But in the Bible, in Genesis 18, we have a record, a historical record of Abraham being at his tent door and three men are standing a few, a short distance away from him that look probably more than human, uh, more majestic than a normal human being. And he bows before them and says that he wants to make a meal for them and calls his servant to make a meal for them. And they sit and they eat together. And in that account in Genesis, he addresses one of them as Yahweh, which is the most sacred name for God, which basically means the ultimate reality or the I am that I am that is separate above and far and beyond creation. Yes, God created man, and he is able in this little speck of a planet in the vastness of this universe that is beyond comprehension to come down and communicate with man in human form as he did with Abraham, as he did when he came to Abraham with Melchizedek, which is also described as being without beginning of days in Hebrews. And he came in Jesus Christ on the cross, and humbled himself more than you, a mere creature, and suffered more than you, a mere creature, on the cross, so that you could freely choose to ask God for forgiveness and be reconciled to God. Because he broke his body onto death and poured out his life's blood, the blood that came from God, not from a human being, through Mary was poured out on the cross so that you could be cleansed of your sin and forgiven and reconciled to God. So if you cry from the depths of your being and mean it and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, he will come into your life, he will forgive you, and his spirit will come into your inner being. And as Christ said, whoever believes with their life into me, out of their innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And you can experience that being restored to fellowship with God and know that you will have a destiny in heaven. I've written a book called Afterlife Incredible Irrefutable, which you can purchase on Amazon. 368 pages in a large paperback or you can get it on your iPhone as a Kindle with many links that go to YouTube videos, highly verifying the reality of life after death and of what many people have experienced. People like Dean Braxton, spelled B-R-A-X-T-O-N, which you can look up on the internet. You type in N-D-E, standing for near-death experiences, is one example, and there's others. And the love that they experience in that dimension. It's so, you know, I could talk about life after death. It's so amazing. 
and such a superior dimension to this dimension. Your intelligence is so great that many have a life review of their whole life where they don't only see all that they did in their life, but every thought that they thought and how it affected people, 10 people over and more, how the thoughts affected people from the beginning of their life to the end, and they see that all, and it's absorbed by their intelligence that it's so super superior in a few seconds. They can absorb the whole of their life and know everything about it. And they're sent back, and the, 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 what God shows them is how they didn't love and how their negative or their unloving thoughts and how their loving thoughts affected people, encouraging them when they return to love because God is love. And the love I've just described to you is beyond comprehension. You cannot imagine a love that is greater than this love, nor could there exist a love that is greater than this love. And only this love could be entrusted with unlimited power and authority and life without being corrupted by that or using that unlimited power and authority and life in a corrupt way, thus indicative that God is the very source, the one that is this love. And yes, for God to be almighty, he also must be in three personage, be, personages because he must rule in the three ultimate aspects of existence, which are beyond creation, in creation, and filling all creation. As God the Father, he sees the end from the beginning beyond creation. The Son is the one and only expression of God the Father into the time and space realm. To communicate on a limited creature level and experience the blessing of his creation and fellowship with them. And the Holy Spirit in omnipresence attached to every particle of existence, able to raise the dead all at once. And yes, Christ can appear in many dimensions of time to millions of people at the same time, because there are many planes of time that can intersect our linear plane of time <clears throat> or any other plane of time in other dimensions. And so I am telling you about the one true God, which is the God that is described in the Bible in the New and the Old Testament. The one true eternal God Yahweh, which is in the original Hebrew, Elohim. Elohim means the Almighty in the original Hebrew, referring to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it says in Zechariah of Israel, which this prophecy hasn't come true yet, but when they are cornered and their military might is broken, and two-thirds of them go into captivity and are tortured. At that time, Christ will return and come on the Mount of Olives, and it will split in half. And it says in Zechariah chapter 12 that they will look on me whom they have pierced. The word me is referring to Yahweh, the one true eternal God. Jesus Christ referred to himself as Yahweh when he said that he is the I am that I am when addressing the Pharisees. Because the I am that I am is referring to that most sacred name. And so I'm sharing with you good news. That is the truth. And the more people, as time goes on, the evidence will become greater and greater of the truth. And people that don't want the truth will reject this love of God and who God is more and more, even though the truth is right in front of their eyes. And it will get to the point where everyone will see God returning from the heavens. And it says in Revelations, they will call for the mountains and the rocks to hide from the face of him that sits upon the throne from the wrath of God because they rejected his love that is a consuming fire of judgment against all that is contrary to love. And he is returning soon. And I could talk for a long time about many other interesting things. Tim Horan has a man of God that has prophesied many things that have come true, including uh, a major asteroid to hit the Earth in April of 2029, April the 13th of 2029. And that asteroid has been discovered and is being traced with very great concern by NASA. And it says in the Word of God that at that time, the sun will be darkened like sackcloth and the moon will like blood. Because when that asteroid hits, that will happen. And it says right after that, that Christ will return and those that are walking in a close relationship with God will be translated and brought to be in union with God and in fellowship with God to reign 
with him in the heavens and upon the earth. And you can find your destiny, destiny there. I'm sharing with you just a little bit of the evidence that will increase to the point that it will become so great that you will finally see him returning in the heavens and then it will be too late. So is your heart being hardened against the truth of God's love and rejecting a love that's so great that if you were the only one that was created, he would have still humbled himself more than you, you a mere creature? and suffered more than you, a mere creature, on the cross? Would you reject that love that is the very source of life and of beauty and of all good? When you're cut off from that, all that's left is torment in hell. And it's beyond anything you can experience as far as the torment in this physical dimension. I know that because I've seen the testimonies of people that have experienced hell when they died. They're in... There's links to those videos in my book. So it's good news that you can choose to receive the love of God. You just have to humble yourself and let your pride be broken and, so, and, and ask him to come into your life who loves you so much. And Dean Braxton said the love was so great in that other dimension that there's no way you could comprehend or describe it in this inferior dimension. It was so great that he knew that if he was the only one that God created, he would have humbled himself more than him a mere creature, suffered more than him a mere creature on the cross so that he could repent and be reconciled to God. I could go on describing the glories of heaven, but you could get that in my book. Thank you for watching this video. It's good news I'm sharing with you. I'm not here to belittle anyone or to show disrespect but I am in some measure outraged at the fact that the God that created such things as the genes and the chromosomes with such amazing information in it that's far beyond what anything man could ever do would be so insolent and conceited to not believe in God and to not see what he's created and to choose to believe a lie. It says in the last days in the word of God that God will give them strong delusion to believe a lie that they all might be damned, that loved not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Thank you for listening to this message of the good news.